Before I start this video, I want to say first that I am an Andromeda fan. I think it was a good game despite its issues, and could probably be improved upon had it had gotten a true sequel. But with that said, I still hope the next game doesn't take us back to the timeline of Andromeda. If you've been following all the hints and clues we've been shown for Mass Effect 5, then you know Andromeda is being included in some capacity. We've seen direct timeline mentions of 2819, we've seen both galaxies, Angara, soundtracks from Andromeda, signs from Andromeda, and many other clues. It's happening. And from what we've seen, I think there are three possible timelines that the next game will take place in. A few years after Mass Effect 3, a few years after the events of Andromeda, or they will find a way to combine the two timelines. I'm going to go over why I think returning to the Milky Way galaxy should be the next game's focus, dissect any clues and hints that connect to Andromeda, and explain why I don't want to return to the Andromeda galaxy. So, first off, why do I think we should go back to the Milky Way galaxy instead of the Andromeda galaxy? And I think it's pretty obvious. There's a ton of questions left after the ending of Mass Effect 3. What actually happened with the endings? Was the Star Child lying? How do the endings actually work? What happened to our companions? And of course, what happened to Shepard? And yes, some of these answers are defined by your ending choices, but there is a lot within the world that exists that doesn't revolve around Shepard. And I want to see what the galaxy looks like after the Reaper War. Aside from the actual endings, there's a ton of lore that was set up that was never explored. What about all the various relays that haven't been traveled through? What about the rest of the Milky Way galaxy that hasn't even been explored yet? What about the fate of the Leviathan? Or the Ralloy? The virtual aliens? The Kirik? All these races that have been given comprehensive lore connections to the greater Milky Way galaxy that have all been left unanswered. Did the Ralloy trick the Reapers into not harvesting them? What happened to the virtual aliens who swapped consciousness with the individuals on the Citadel? Were the Kirik determined to be intelligent by the Council? What happened to the Leviathan once the Reapers were gone? These are just a tiny portion of the lingering questions revolving races in the wider lore and questions I'd like to know the answer to. And the reality is that a lot of these questions may never be answered. And sometimes it's okay to just leave threads up in the air without finalizing them. But Mass Effect 3's endings always felt like we just barely learned what happened to the Milky Way galaxy. We never really get to see the true effects of what happened, aside from a slideshow of our companions, depending on if you choose destroy, synthesis, or control. But we never really learn how the greater galaxy fared. To me, Mass Effect 3 never really gave me the closure I needed, especially with Shepard's breath. That breath haunts me, because it doesn't necessarily feel like Shepard lives to me. I know the devs have confirmed it, and that is what that means, but there's still so many questions around it that I have. Who found Shepard? Did Shepard need another round of repairs? Is Shepard's lifespan longer than your average human, similar to how Miranda's is? And yes, some of these questions can also just be left as fan headcanons. And I'd argue that fans have had over 10 years to establish their own stories of what happened to their shepherds if they lived. So all of this is complicated territory. But this next game has the opportunity to provide some insight into what happened to Shepard, our companions, and the entire galaxy. And I genuinely hope that they do. They also have the potential to really expand on the world building. We still need to see Palavin. Maybe we could also see a restored Tuchanka, and finally see what the Corian homeworld Rannoch looks like, especially if they're working alongside the Geth. Maybe we see the Geth becoming recognized by the larger galaxy as sentient after fighting the Council's AI laws. I don't know, there's really just so many possibilities there story-wise to connect to story threads that have already been set up. And one of those major threads is the dark energy plot that was dropped in Mass Effect 2 and it was never picked up again. It's the perfect way to connect the games and tie back to what we already know while also expanding upon it. So yes, I think there's a ton left in the Milky Way galaxy. I feel like we only touched the surface of the alien civilizations and the galaxy at large. 
Mass Effect has really intricate lore, and so much of it hasn't been explored. Not only do we have the timeline of our Reaper harvest, but the timelines of thousands of years completely wiped out from their harvest. We haven't learned barely anything about the Prothean Empire, nor have we learned anything about other Protheans aside from Javik. What if there are aliens out there that survived previous harvesting cycles, and we just haven't met them yet? There's so many possibilities. And while I do actually think we'll be in the Milky Way galaxy based on these pictures, we've also seen several Andromeda references, including a direct reference to the year that Andromeda takes place. So the dev team is clearly pointing in that direction. And while I enjoyed Andromeda, I don't particularly want to return there. Before you close the video, hear me out. I want the next game to be about the Milky Way galaxy. But if the game does well, if Bioware does well, I think Andromeda could do well with a real sequel or a DLC. But there wasn't enough investment for me to want to return there for another main game. And if you disagree, that's absolutely fair and totally fine. This is just how I feel about Andromeda. And I'm going to be critical while trying to remain fair. As a disclaimer, I also played Andromeda three years ago for the first time. So I didn't play it during its initial bug-filled release. So I know I have a different perspective than someone that played during its 2017 release. With that said, I have seven major criticisms for Andromeda. My first and main issue with Andromeda is that tonally it was a major shift from the original trilogy. Andromeda was a much more lighthearted game with a lighter and younger tone than the original trilogy. And we know this was intentional. An interview about Andromeda revealed that it was intentionally made to feel more like a CW show, which the CW is geared more towards a young adult audience. And I think that's felt all throughout Andromeda. And while I don't necessarily think that this is bad, I also don't think that Mass Effect is really the place for that, especially in a main game following the trilogy. It's very clear Andromeda wanted to bring in a younger, newer audience. And I think part of the trilogy's appeal is that it is very forward about being a game for adults. Not only are the game's themes and storylines darker, but the sexual content, the graphic content, and the horror elements are not for a younger audience. That's not to say young people didn't play it because they absolutely did, but Shepard was 29 when the trilogy started and was in their 30s by the end of all three games. That is a fully grown adult with a very adult life. And that's the audience it felt like it was geared towards. And that was lost in Andromeda, which I have always found as an odd choice, considering it didn't feel like the franchise grew with the original fan base which you would think would be its main target audience. By the time Andromeda came out in 2017, Mass Effect had already been around since 2007, since the game's first launch. It had been 10 years since the first game came out, 10 years for the fan base to grow alongside the franchise, 10 years for all of those fans to get older. And then Bioware releases a game that's made for an even younger audience with a very young protagonist in comparison to Shepard. And I'm not saying every Mass Effect game has to have a protagonist that's older and continues to get older. I'm just saying that it was a major disconnect from what we felt in the original trilogy with Shepard. For me, my writer, no matter which dialogue options I chose, writers still felt very young, inexperienced and unsure of themselves, which is fine, but they never really felt like they grow out of it. They don't lose that trait. Even at the end of the game, Ryder still felt relatively the same, in my experience. And Ryder was fun, and Ryder was sometimes funny, and I did enjoy Ryder's dynamic with some of the crewmates, but as someone in my mid-30s, I was not connected with Ryder. And Mass Effect will always have a Shepard problem. Shepard will always be the IT character. Shepard will always be iconic and remembered so fondly by the fanbase. Whether they return or not, Shepard is truly such a massive part of the franchise, if not the main driving force, as of right now anyways. So yes, Ryder was inevitably compared to Shepard, as will whatever protagonist will be in the next game. We can all say not to do it, and we can all try our best not to do it, 
But Shepard is like this looming presence on the franchise. And I have no idea how they're going to handle that beast moving forward. But what I was trying to say is that no, Ryder is not Shepard. But I think making Ryder a very young, inexperienced character that lacks confidence and presence like Shepard did was probably not the best choice in the first game that came out after the original trilogy. And that doesn't mean that that story doesn't belong in Mass Effect. I just think that Ryder following Shepard, being such stark opposites and being tailored toward different audiences was one of Andromeda's major issues, if not the major issue with the game. And I know a lot of people want to play as Ryder again. And personally, I don't. I would prefer a brand new protagonist over Ryder returning. I just want a fresh start with no connections to previous choices or romances. Do I think Ryder could actually return? Honestly, I don't think so. But if they did bring back Ryder, I hope Ryder has aged, matured, and gained more confidence. And I think that could definitely be done. I just still think I'd prefer a clean slate. And any direct Ryder sequel would most likely keep Ryder in the Andromeda galaxy because there's so many unresolved mysteries and I can't see Ryder focusing on the Milky Way galaxy anyways, which is what I want. So can Ryder return? Yes, with exceptional writing, but I don't think that they should. I've said before that I'd prefer a Dragon Age Inquisition Hawk type situation where we see them again, but more as a cameo than anything. My next major issue with Andromeda is kind of hard to pinpoint because it's hard to determine what aspects of the aesthetics of the game were let down by Frostbite and its engine versus the actual designs. If you watched my last video, I went on this whole tangent about how odd the Angara look. And it's probably one of the things I least like in Andromeda. The aliens look weird. Not only just the Angara, but the Turians, the Krogan, the Solarians, they look odd. The legs, the faces, the body animations were so janky sometimes that it's hard to look at the Angara and Andromeda and not be skeptical about their return. I've already said that I think that the Angara concepts were a lot more interesting. And I think the Angara designs are off. The female Angara walk especially weird, not even because they're aliens, but because it doesn't look like it makes sense anatomically. And again, this may very well be the animation and engine issues from Frostbite, but that's something that always bothers me in my playthroughs. So if the Angara are returning in the next game, which I assume they are, I hope that they can revitalize their designs and anatomy to better fit Unreal Engine and just look better aesthetically. On top of the overall aesthetics of the aliens looking odd, there are so many Asari with the same face that it's just not great to look at. PB's face is unlike any other Asari that we've seen, and I just think the design of her face coupled with the black strike on her eyes was just not for me. I was not interested in romancing her, and I just generally don't find characters in Andromeda attractive. And maybe that's shallow to say, and maybe not polite to say, but I think there's strong merit in having sexy, attractive characters in your game. Because look at Baldur's Gate 3. Those characters are sexy. They are beautiful. They are good looking. And that fan base is absolutely feral for them. And the Mass Effect fandom is like that too, but far less so for Andromeda characters. So ultimately, design wise, on top of the engine issues, there was something that I think all of the companions were missing. And I think part of that missing puzzle piece was a bit of sexiness. Again, just my opinion. And I think the same sentiment even applies to default Ryder and Sarah. I was able to make a cute female Ryder, but I could never feel like I could make a sexy character without mods. And that's such a weird thing to say out loud, but it's the truth. I wasn't a huge fan of Andromeda's character creation. Aside from the design and aesthetic issues I have with Andromeda, the companions themselves felt very lackluster especially when compared to the original trilogy. I mostly connected with Jal and Vetra, as I know a lot of people did, but the rest of the companions fell short for me, even the Tempest crew. There should have been more grit, more conflict, more tension, more relationships amongst the crew aside from Ryder. 
I just really didn't feel as much of an emotional connection to the crew, except for Jal. Mostly because the story is so connected to his individual story as an Angara and finding about the history of his people. That was the most interesting aspect of the game for me. The Angara and the Jardan. It also wasn't the type of game where I wanted to go back and try other romances, which is how I am with other Bioware games. The romances are a major appeal. And aside from Jal, I just really didn't feel any major pull to any of the characters. And despite that, Jal's romance was very good. He is my favorite character in that game. The Angara were also really interesting. And I think Mass Effect is at its best when it's letting you, the human protagonist, connect with a new alien and their world and connect with their life. And aside from the Angara quest and storylines, I think Andromeda was really missing that aspect. So much of it was exploring areas the initiative had begun settling on, and I think those were the most boring part of the game. The remnant tech and vaults were really interesting though, and I think if those story threads had been expanded upon, it could have been really interesting. But alas, I think one of the most interesting aspects of the game isn't really the vaults themselves. It's more about who created them, which alien race, which alien civilization, and when are the most interesting questions surrounding the vaults, and we never find out the answers. Jal finding out the Angara were created by the Jardan is probably the most interesting story and concept in the game, to me anyways. It's a new story we haven't explored, and the concept of the Jardan creating empty vessels is fascinating. But it feels like such a small part of the overall game that is so filled with unnecessary quest that it falls short when you finally reach the climax. And in the end, of course, the game's setting up for future stories, and we never got them. So the writing is another criticism that I had. The many quests that were unrelated to the greater story is something I hope Bioware learns from after both Andromeda and Inquisition. Those games had better stories when you focused on the linear narrative of the actual main story while ignoring a lot of the filler content. Which brings me to the final issue with the game, and that's the empty worlds. Again, this is something I hope Bioware learns from, as it's a mistake they've repeated twice. And while I think there is some good in those open worlds, a lot of it is mindless fetch quest. The most interesting side quests I think we get in Andromeda are the quests surrounding the Yavara and the ancient AI. Any story revolving around AI is pretty interesting in the Mass Effect universe, and I thought that one had a lot of potential, especially if it was created by the Jardan. So there's obviously good in Andromeda. There were some really interesting story threads and ties into greater stories that just weren't finished. And I hope eventually they do one day find some way to at least answer some of these questions. I also think that while I wasn't the hugest fan of some of the companions, the voice actors did a great job bringing the characters to life as much as they could. And even if we don't return directly to Andromeda right now, I still hope all of the cast returns, especially Tom Taylorson and Frida Wolf, who received some extremely harsh and scary backlash for their role as writer. I would love to see all of them return to the series so that their last connection with the franchise isn't a bad one, and they are all seemingly staying somewhat connected to the franchise. Tom Taylorson has been active every N7 day, showing his love for Mass Effect, and recently, in an interview, said he's heard some rumblings about what's going on with the next game. So who knows, maybe they will return and maybe Andromeda will be the focus. I also just want to say that I think the Bioware team never releasing Andromeda DLC was such a detriment to the game. They could have absolutely improved upon the storyline and loose threads with a DLC that at the very least answered questions surrounding the Corian arc. Mass Effect 1 didn't release as perfect. Those companions especially grew on people over the course of three total games, each one improving upon them more than the last. And of course, the Mass Effect 1 companions were better in terms of writing and originality, but the team also made them better with time. And it's a shame that the Corian Arc DLC never came to be. I also think that centers around a lot of fan frustrations 
And if we got that DLC, maybe we wouldn't be in the position where we are now, where both timelines are going to have to be merged with some weird timeline or time travel mumbo jumbo if they decide to go that route anyways. I also think something that unintentionally failed Andromeda is that the characters were hard to connect with because of the animation issues. Yes, they've been updated and fairly overhauled since its initial release, but they are nowhere near in comparison to what you'd expect from a Bioware game. I think if the characters had had better animations and expressions, they would have connected more with the audience. With that said, those same characters, if brought back, could be overhauled with designs more in line with what we get in the original trilogy and given far better animations and expressions, which is something Bioware has always excelled at. But this is an investment. Bioware bringing back the Andromeda crew means that they will have to invest in fixing issues from Andromeda while trying to resell the characters to the fan base again. And I'm not saying that these characters are terrible by any means. Most of the characters are good and at worst, okay. All these characters would most likely have to be either remodeled or ported from Frostbite to Unreal, and rigs and animations would have to be overhauled. Game dev is sectioned off into what can be paid for. And from Andromeda interviews, we know that they were given the budget for two new races, the Angara and the Ket, and that's it. Every character brought back, every new model made, is a portion of the budget. So when I think about Mass Effect 5, I think about how much budgeting will be given to different aspects. And while I don't think Andromeda should be abandoned by any means, is this a type of investment I want for the next game? For the budget to be heavily invested in repairing Andromeda's issues? I don't really think so. But yes, there are absolutely several unanswered questions left to discover in Andromeda. Who killed Jean Garson? Who is the benefactor? Who are the Jardan? What happened to Ryder's mom? I also want to say that I am a huge Andromeda fan. So while I do have all of these criticisms, I still love some moments with Ryder and all the companions. And I love the combat and jump jets and being able to explore in a more open world. I also really like the concept of Sam, though I don't know if I'd enjoy another Sam in our head situation, but that type of AI, especially with Sam's complicated history and interesting answers, I think that was a neat advancement of the AI questions that Mass Effect ask us. I also really like the family dynamic and wish that our sibling would have been a more permanent companion. Such a cool dynamic, and yet we only had it for a very short time in the actual game. So there is some good there. And I think if Andromeda had been given a proper sequel, it could have made the game even better. And I hope I spoke on this topic with enough nuance and understanding that the Andromeda dev team had a lot working against them and honestly did their best. It's unfortunate Andromeda wasn't the perfect sequel following the trilogy that everyone wanted. And I think that a part of that reality is that any game following the original trilogy was always going to be heavily scrutinized for the major daunting task of following in the trilogy's footsteps. And I think we'll see that again with this next game. Mass Effect is such a beloved franchise that people hold so dearly, and especially their unique experiences with their Shepard. So to see how this game hopefully and finally moves those aspects forward is going to mean a lot to a lot of people. Mass Effect 5 will be compared to the original trilogy, and now it will also be compared to Andromeda. People will be looking to make sure that the sequel doesn't also make the same mistakes of Andromeda. The protagonist and companions will be heavily scrutinized alongside the animations, which will also be heavily dissected by the fandom and media that absolutely tore Andromeda apart. And I'm not saying Andromeda didn't deserve criticism because it absolutely did. But man, was it overhated, and it still is. And I stand by the fact that Andromeda is a good game. It has interesting worlds to explore, great combat, great armors, amazing music, and some really good characters. There was a foundation there to make something really good. And while it ultimately fell short, there's still potential. So yes, I'd like to see Andromeda fixed isn't really the right word, but more like made better, improved upon. 
And I can understand why this next game could have the potential to actually do that. So are we actually going back to Andromeda? I've made this visual of all the Andromeda connections alongside all of the Milky Way connections. And it's very clear that Andromeda has been teased and hinted at, not to mention all of Gamble's not so subtle comments. But let's actually look at some of these teasers. Could they actually be in the Andromeda galaxy? Realistically, I think almost any of the teasers could be Andromeda, except for these four images. This first image is clearly of Ilium. And why do I think this is in the Milky Way galaxy? Because the Andromeda people did not have the resources for this type of civilization building yet. Ilium, which looks exactly like this art of Ilium, is one of the youngest Asari colonies, settled during the seventh expansion wave and has about 85 million inhabitants, which is why it is so dense and populated. The entirety of the Andromeda Initiative mission was only about 100,000 individuals. So the world's being built quickly, populated and densely inhabited isn't realistic, especially because several initiative colonies were being established across various worlds. I think the same concept applies to the second piece of concept art, which also looks heavily populated like these buildings were built long ago. We know what early settlement of Andromeda looks like, and it's not this by any means. Even Kadara Port wasn't settled by the initiative. It originally was created by the Angara, who built it. So even that can't be counted as advanced colonization from the initiative because they didn't do the initial work. So realistically, in the first two years of Andromeda's settlement, there has been very little progress with establishing any cities or actual colonies. And I think if there's a return to Andromeda, it would be around Ryder's timeline of 2819. Because if it isn't, then why even bother returning? So I think that rules out these two images with this one being the third. I know some other creators don't believe this is new, but it absolutely is. This is altered old Citadel art that now shows a removed skyline, no Presidium, a new location, and a new ship. There were no Citadels in the Andromeda galaxy, only the one that we knew of in the Milky Way galaxy. Unless this is a different Citadel, which would mean there were Reapers in other galaxies, and I think that's a little too far-fetched. So yes, I think this also absolutely points to the Milky Way galaxy. And the same applies to this latest N7 reveal, the poster of the N7 that shows some type of afterlife-looking club. These are very much the exact aesthetics we see in the original trilogy, as well as races that never made it to Andromeda. The Geth, Hanar, and Volus specifically. Everything about this image screams familiarity. From the designs of the chairs, which remind me of seating in the Citadel DLC, to the multiple floors. So I also believe that this is from the original trilogy. So yes, I do think we will be returning to locations of the original trilogy and exploring more areas that we haven't seen yet. There are many relays that haven't been explored, and this clip of the relay says Cetherium System, which is a name for an extinct otter. I couldn't find any constellations or actual systems named this, so it's clearly a new location we haven't been to. Maybe it's the system on the other side of the Relay 314. Maybe it's a new relay where another possible 314 incident may have occurred. Who knows? And yes, this could be in the Andromeda system, if as many people as possible from the initiative came together to build this relay. That is far more plausible than entire cities being formed. But the 314 is referencing the 314 relay incident which happened in the Milky Way galaxy. On top of this, the colors definitely give off Cerberus vibes, as with Gamble liking a tweet of someone specifically pointing out that it is Cerberus colors. This makes me lean more towards this being in the Milky Way, but we don't know. And while there is obviously Milky Way visuals, there's also this piece that stumps me, especially because of Gamble's comment. When someone implied that this is Prothean or Remnant, he said, or maybe it's dot, 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 which leads me to believe this could be from a new alien race. This could very well be something we discover in the Milky Way galaxy or Andromeda galaxy. 
These other images are mostly of crew, and some of this has reused assets, which is common in concept art. So while we shouldn't be looking too much into all of this anyways, this piece shows a Drell, which as of 2819 hadn't made it to Andromeda. Maybe this is another Milky Way piece, who knows? These concepts that appear to be maybe companions are vague enough to be from any place. But with this one, the visual of the door looks very similar to the underground facility that Cerberus had on Nepheron. The surroundings were different, and I don't think this is Nepheron, but the door hatch looks similar. Aside from the concept art, we also have the two clips. The initial teaser, which obviously has the opening shot of both galaxies, and then includes two Andromeda clues. A mention of the Arc 6 and Godspeed, which is said to ride her during the Tempest's first takeoff. As far as Milky Way references, we have the galaxy itself in the opening shot, the destroyed Reapers, destroyed Relay, and Liara from the Milky Way galaxy, and the N7 helmet. So again, we're seeing evidence of both connections. So more Milky Way than Andromeda though. Which leads me to the N7 trailer we got this last N7 day. And first off, there is no way for someone to become an actual N7 in the Andromeda galaxy. There is no N7 training and testing to go through. The actual N7 training requires a recruit to go through the Interplanetary Combatives Academy, also known as N School or the Villa. This academy recruits officers from every branch of Earth's military to partake in the actual rigorous N7 testing, which includes excelling in combat, in active combat zones, and an intense survival exercise. This could take roughly a year to complete. There could also be no new N7s in Andromeda because of this. They cannot complete the testing to earn the rank in Andromeda. So this N7 has to be from the Milky Way galaxy. This N7 is also walking in front of a very busy skyline and cityscape. I don't think this is the relay location, unless they're on the world below in the relay clip. And like I mentioned before, Andromeda wouldn't have this type of developed city. But there are some interesting tracks related to Andromeda being put in this audio. It contains half original trilogy music and half Andromeda music. We have Horizon Sanctuary slash Arlette Company and Return to Eden Prime from the original trilogy. And then we have the Garden Tower and one additional Andromeda soundtrack that I couldn't find the name for. But I've analyzed these clips more in another video. So if you're interested, you can check that out but we're seeing more pulls from both timelines and games. So if you doubted that Andromeda wasn't going to be connected to the next game, hopefully all of this changes your mind because it is going to be included. But how it will actually be involved is still left unanswered. And Mike Gamble worked on Andromeda. He was a producer. And now he's leading Mass Effect 5. He's not going to abandon his previous team's work and his own work on Andromeda it's undoubtedly going to be included, as it should be. And I assume they are working on improving on whatever they're bringing in from Andromeda. I just hope that it doesn't become the focus of the game. We also have to look at the Bioware formula and what does that mean for the next game? In the Dragon Age games where each game has a new protagonist and a set of companions, there is usually only a small handful of returning characters. If what Mac Walters said about them not wanting to do another trilogy because they already did it is true, then that could mean that this next game gets a new protagonist. And if that's the case, I would expect a new roster of companions, meaning only a few select previous companions would actually return. And I would prefer to see original trilogy characters so we can learn what happened after the events of Mass Effect 3, then Andromeda characters. I think when it comes to the endings, there's also a lot of issues with the ending itself, which is probably due to time crunch and the situations surrounding the ending's writing. But with so many issues, it's no wonder people came up with the indoctrination theory, which, if you're familiar with, has some ground to it. This one has bothered me for a while, and no, it's not canon, and there's no way they'd ever make it canon, but I think it just shows the way that fans coped with the ending of the game because it leaves so many unanswered questions. 
why wasn't Shepard indoctrinated anyways? There were so many opportunities for it. Obviously, this is a bit of main character syndrome, but I still think it's interesting to think about. Why was Shepard not in control and why did they shoot Anderson? That one really bothers me. Anyways, the endings don't really feel like an ending to me. Maybe an ending to Shepard's story, yes, but they completely changed the galaxy as we know it and we see none of the after effects. I need to know. And I think they're going to have to address the endings because we are seeing one major thing related to the ending choice, the Geth. We've now seen Geth that are dead, Geth that are alive, and we've heard Geth potentially speaking to Liara. I think it's very clear the Geth will be important in Mass Effect 5. And if the Geth are returning, it doesn't necessarily mean that any one ending is canon. Because I think there's several ways that you can maybe reactivate the Geth after destroy. But if the Geth have survived, which they clearly have, there will have to be a connection to the ending. And there will have to be an explanation as to how they actually survived. So with all of this said and explained, what do I actually want from Mass Effect 5? For reasons I just stated, mostly involving Shepard's impact being felt in the galaxy, I want to return closer to Mass Effect 3. I want to see the galaxy being repaired after the Reaper War. I want to see a smaller scale game setting up the galaxy again with a more political focus. Exploring what the galaxy looks like without the elusive man behind Cerberus, how the Council fared after fumbling helping Shepard, how will Shepard's involvement in the war affect the system's alliance? What happened to Omega and did Omega move in to gain more power after the war? I'd love to see more of a society-based threat than a galaxy-wide scale threat. I really just want to see the aftermath. I want to see Rannoch and Tuchanka, and I want to learn all about our companions from the original trilogy. And of course, I want to know what happened to Shepard. But if Andromeda is involved, this makes this less likely, because as everyone knows, Ryder's timeline takes place 633 years in the future. So if they're finding a way to merge the two galaxies and two timelines, I think that there's a few ways that you can do this. Time travel, time dilation, wormholes, to name a few, which might be happening because of the trailer, which says anomalies found all across space. But while these are possible, these are honestly things I'm not too excited about. If having these means we can be closer to the ending of Mass Effect 3, I'll accept them, but I think they're a lot harder to do than simply bringing back the Milky Way galaxy, but then pushing the Milky Way galaxy ahead to the year 2819 and having the story take place in both galaxies at the same time, in the future timeline of the Milky Way and current timeline of Andromeda. This is what I expect. It's not what I want, but I think it's the easiest thing to do story-wise. They really wrote themselves in a corner with Andromeda, specifically with the time jump. And repairing it is going to take some really, really, really good writing to move the franchise forward. I also do not expect to see Shepard return in physical form. I think bringing Shepard back is far too complicated story-wise. It overrides a lot of people's headcanons and choices from Mass Effect 3, and removes the agency you feel when you replay the trilogy. It's dangerous ground. Would it be awesome? Yes, but I fully expect a new protagonist. Not Ryder, not Shepard, a new N7. I do expect to learn about Shepard's life though, maybe in vids or voice memos or memorials, maybe even from Liara's time capsule. But I think bringing back Shepard means you'd have to model new default faces and bring back all of the character customization options from the original trilogy as well. While bringing back Shepard would be a financial success, I feel like this next game is going to be a soft reboot of the franchise, setting up sequels and essentially a new setting with new characters for new players and returning players to get invested in. I think bringing the game forward and then loosely merging all the endings and making certain choices essentially canon is how the franchise will have to move forward in the end. If we ever want to see Tuchanka, I think it'll have to have the genophage cured. And I think any version of seeing Rannoch will also have to canonize choices around the Geth and Corian's futures. If they basically say, oh, if you chose Synthesis, 
everyone evolved out of having the green coating on their bodies. And if you chose control, maybe Shepard took the Reapers elsewhere after restoring the galaxy. And if you chose destroy, Hackett says everything can be rebuilt. And maybe that includes the synthetics after all. So essentially everything is back to normal without any major changes. If you push the setting so far out into the future, you don't have to bring Shepard back in any capacity, even if the perfect destroy ending is factored in. There's no way Shepard would live over 600 more years, even with Project Lazarus. There's just so many routes that they can go if they push the game out and tell Shepard's story as something that happened long ago. And like I said, I know it's the easiest route, so I kind of expect it. But I also think that that would be the more boring way to approach the endings. But also, how do you even follow that ending anyways? A game that factored in every choice would be three entirely different games. It's unreasonable and unrealistic. If they truly can make this game reflect our choices, then major props to them. But I've also accepted that the reality of game development is you're only given so much time, so many resources and so much money to actually make something tangible. And their task is already overwhelming with moving the franchise forward, but also having to make every choice and outcome possible. It just isn't feasible. That would be three different games, like I just said. So I will accept whatever they do and will be reasonable with my expectations. I still do really want to see the after effects of Shepard's choices and life on the galaxy though. This is what I want to see most in the next game. So yes, in my opinion, some choices will most likely have to be canonized to move the world forward. I just hope that they can do it in a way that lets us feel like Shepard truly did have an impact on the galaxy, like their sacrifice was worth it. I think that's my biggest fear. I loved my Shepard and her story with Liara, and knowing I'll never get to continue it hurts. All the headcanons, fanfic, and fan art will never amount to seeing animated scenes of Ali Hillis and Jennifer Hale as Liara and Shepard. So if we truly have to put Shepard to rest, please let their legacy be as grand as the adventure felt. I still want to be able to replay the original trilogy and feel like my choices still matter. I want to feel like I can relive Shepard's story without having to lean towards certain choices because I know they've become canon. And I think this is something the dev team will and is taking into account, considering the Legendary Edition just came out in 2021. The Legendary Edition repackaged that perfect trilogy and revitalized the franchise. But it also brought a ton of new fans who feel connected to their Shepard and story and will want to replay those games over and over for years to come, myself included. So even from a financial or marketing perspective, I guess, I can't see them negating all your choices from the Legendary Edition anyways. And even after saying all of this, I still have no idea what Bioware is going to do. This franchise is so beloved, and it's already had one game where people felt like it wasn't in line with what they know. Gamble and the team have a heavy, daunting task, fulfilling the wishes and expectations of established fans while also respecting the Bioware formula of choice. And they have to do all of it while also bringing in new fans to the franchise. It's a lot. I have no idea how they're going to do it. And I wonder if even at this point, they truly know. I feel like every teaser we've been shown is just enough of a tease that leaves every possibility open and that they could change their mind. But the game has been in development since 2019. So it's been in development for six years now. I hope they have stuff figured out. I also have to say that the entire discourse around Andromeda is honestly exhausting. People trying to declare that it isn't canon or that it still isn't being included are just delusional. It's going to be included, whether people like it or not. And the whole argument about what the next game is being called is just silly. Saying it's being called four instead of five specifically as a way to exclude Andromeda because you think Andromeda isn't canon or whatever stupid argument I've seen is so ridiculous. I don't care what you call the next game, but as of right now, its standing development name is Mass Effect 5 and trying to be intentionally exclusionary by calling it 4 won't change that. 
Sorry for the tangent, but I title my videos Mass Effect 5 because it aligns with what the developing studio, what Bioware is calling the game. And the amount of hate that I get and the amount of people trying to correct me is just mind boggling. It's exhausting and annoying. Anyways, if you're still here, thank you for listening. This is something that I think about often because so many clues and hints point towards locations all over the timeline. And when I'm working on theory videos, I'm always asking myself, what timeline is this referencing? Because I think it's the most important question that's unanswered as of right now. Let me know what you think about all of this. Do you want to go back to Andromeda? Do you want to be in the timeline of Ryder or after Shepard? Do you want to see Shepard again? And how would you feel if they used time dilation or time travel or something else kind of out there to connect the two timelines? These are highly debated topics amongst the fandom and pretty controversial, so please let me know your thoughts. Let me know in the comments and a special thank you to my channel members. Thank you for watching.